Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone is doing mentally well and healthy. So I would like to I would like to thank everyone for taking their time to join our webinar today, especially on Saturday morning, and also thanks to our speakers as well. So I'm very happy to see many of you here with us today because it means that you're actually interested in mental health topic. Um, I would like to briefly introduce myself a bit. My name is Katie, and I'm also co-founder of the Young Seekers Cambodia. So uh, Young Seekers Cambodia is actually a nonprofit organization that work on enhancing the connectivity among ASEAN and also creating opportunities um, for ASEAN youth as well. Uh, we have our headquarters in Singapore and also have other national chapters across ASEAN and also China. So I will be your host today for today uh, for the webinar on high functioning anxiety. And today we have two speakers with us um, right now who are from two uh, local mental health organization in Cambodia who are working for um, advocating on mental health topics. And they work on many, many different topics uh, as long as it's relating to uh, mental health awareness. Um, but before we let our guest speakers um, introducing themselves, I would like to go through the agenda of our webinar together a bit. Um, we will be running this panel uh, discussion for one hour and then we will end our live because right now we are also on uh, live on our Facebook page. Um, afterwards, we will break into two different rooms for question and answers um, sessions, include some personal story sharings if you feel comfortable with it. So if you have any questions along the way, please feel free to use our chat box functions where our team will also help facilitate the discussion by picking up your uh, question and ask our speakers later on as well. So now without any further delay, I would like to um, ask our speakers to introduce themselves as well as the work of their organizations as well. Um, first, I would like to welcome Ms. Uh, Bora Sawadi, who is the co-founder of Aram Stations to um, introduce herself as well as the work of Aram Station as well. Please, Bong, you may have the floor. Okay, uh, thank you, KD. Uh, and thank you to the Young Seekers Cambodia chapter for inviting Aram Station to be one of the speakers today. And I'm really excited. I'm looking forward to the discussion. I'm also looking forward to learning from you guys about your experience as well. So uh, my name is Bora Sawadi, and currently I am a psychiatric resident. I'm actually a student, but also I'm working as a resident in hospital. And I co-founded Aram Station, which is a local initiative in Cambodia where we work on mental health related topics. We can um, create content and also introduce audience engagement and also have some online consultation in order to help people understand more about mental health and also to promote um, the dynamism and also the interest in mental health in our country and hopefully someday we would go beyond our country to um, further places so yes thank you for today and i'm looking forward to it thank you very much for sharing bong so um, next i would like to welcome mr we Watanat, who is the core team member of untangle mental health projects to also share about his background as well as the work of untangle Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Wanak, a core team member of Untangle, a mental health project in Cambodia. So basically, uh, Untangle is you know, formed from a group of young people who are really passionate about mental health and planning and, and hoping to make change within the mental health sector in Cambodia. So um, the idea is to you know, pick a topic that relate to um, um, the issue um, in, in not just with young people, but across some generation, bring it up, talks about it, normalizing it, and making sure that you know, we, uh, we raise the awareness about mental health to the community. Uh, so myself here, um, I'm living from, uh, from Adelaide, um, Australia at um, 12 p.m. in the afternoon. But yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for having me uh, representing Untangle Cambodia. So just a big shout out to Untangle. Don't forget to go on our Facebook page and give us a thumbs up. But hey, glad to have me here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wong, for sharing as well. So uh, we are very actually uh, very honored to have um, speakers from two different local uh, organizations working on mental health because it's very it's not very common in Cambodia, uh, and we also understand that. And we are very happy to see such progress. And yes, big shout out to both Aram Station and also Untangle. You may also check our Facebook page uh, because we also linked uh, their profile inside uh, each of our posts as well. 
So um, without any further delay, I would like to just move right away into the panel discussions that everyone is waiting for uh, to hear the talk. So the very first questions that I would ask um, both of you is that because we often heard about anxiety where we know that, okay, we are very anxious, we are very nervous, but then when it comes to the terms of high functioning anxiety, it's, it's quite, uh, it's quite, it's not really common to, to heard about that term, adding high functioning in, in front of anxiety. So what exactly is high functioning anxiety and how is it different from the normal anxiety that we often um, talk in our daily life? So um, I would ask Mong Wadi to start first and then we can also hear from Mong Watanak. Thank you, Mong. Yes, thank you, Ona, and thank you for the question. So, of course, today we're going to talk about high-functioning anxiety. So, before we start, we have to get everyone on the same page to know exactly what it is, high-functioning anxiety. Um, actually, to define high-functioning anxiety is a bit complicated because there are so many types of anxiety. You could be anxious about specific object. You could be anxious about not leaving your home, or you could be anxious about just general stuff. But when I hear people talk about high functioning anxiety or when I myself talk about high functioning anxiety, I usually refer to this constant worry or more often than not, we talk about general life anxiety, but they don't um, impact our daily life functioning, which means they are not severe enough to affect our daily life functioning, but they are hard enough for us to feel distressing in ourselves. Um, so typically when we talk about mental illness or to put into technical word or psychiatric diagnosis, you have to go through certain diagnostic procedure where you have to meet certain criteria for a limit um, period of time before you get a diagnosis. But when you have um, high functioning anxiety, some people could be experiencing some symptoms of anxiety, breathlessness, worry, and even insomnia, where you couldn't sleep, for example, and there are a few more, many more anxiety symptoms. But the point is that they don't, do not fulfill the criteria of a mental illness or a psychiatric diagnosis. So yeah, they, they are suffering anxiety, they are hard enough, but they still do not meet the criteria for a full diagnosis. And I think that's the um, point about high functioning anxiety because it actually affects the quality of life of the person. And I think the word quality of life is very important when we talk about high functioning anxiety because yeah, of course they may not meet the criteria for a diagnosis for a um, full illness, but they still feel like they are not living their life really well. They feel distressed. They don't feel content within themselves. So yeah, I think Quality of life is very important when we talk about high functioning anxiety because that person has um, their quality of life affected because of the symptoms and signs. And then what is the difference between high functioning anxiety and normal anxiety? Because we all know, right, like um, anxiety can be normal. We have normal anxiety in our day-to-day -day life. We could be um, anxious because we have our exams. We are going to meet our deadlines. But those anxiety can be good because they push us to do the things. Because we, if we don't have them, we may not meet that line. We may not get ourselves up and go for the exam or go to school for some people. So um, those are the anxiety that are very beneficial to our life. And then you have um, the anxiety that can be so severe that people are going to get the diagnosis for a disorder, like I mentioned earlier, and then they are going to get treatment. But then there are this um, third group of people, like they are sort of in the middle. They, don't meet the criteria for an illness, but they also have the symptoms. And the symptoms are like very severe and they are almost there, almost into the diagnosis, but they're not. So that's the difference between um, high functioning anxiety and normal anxiety. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, Wong. Maybe we can also hear from Wong Watan as well. For sure. Look, I cannot agree more than that. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, yeah, but before I go into talks about high functioning anxiety, I do want to thank the you know, DT Center Mental Health Awareness Month. And you know, myself here, you know, I, I understand my privilege that I you know, have the opportunity to, you know, to study uh, on the topic of mental health overseas. And you know, I would like to take this opportunity 
to um, acknowledge to those who've been you know fighting in their mental health journey i know it is not easy for you, you know, to be fighting within the mental health journey but good on you you know keep fighting it and you know soon or later we're going to go through this together and i do understand and i you know, would like to pay my uh, respect and condolences to those who lost the battle of uh, mental health and to those who decide to rest their life early I know, look, I'm no one to judge your decision on those, but thank you so much. And I, I know that that's the decision you have um, chosen. And thank you to those who, you know, volunteer their time, uh, their input in the mental health sector. Uh, without you, we won't be able to come up with, you know, um, treatments and diagnose. And, and for your uh, uh, commitment to our mental health sector, it is means a lot you know, for, for us to improve the mental health sector. Um, coming back to um, the high functioning anxiety, you know, that's remind me. So I then went back to my DSM-5 booklet and sort of, hmm, because in you know, the whole booklet, I never come across high functioning um, anxiety. Then, then, then I realized that in you know, a high functioning anxiety, you know, talking from a diagnostic perspective, it's, it's not an, an, an official um, um, diagnose from the DSM-5 booklet. So that's, that's a booklet to you know, um, diagnose people with all sorts of mental health. But myself, you know, talking from the, the perspective of talking therapies uh, as, as a counselor and um, psychotherapist, you know, I, for me to give a definition of high functioning anxiety is a um, clear, transparent, protective shell uh, around you that yes, you can see through it. Yes, you uh, perform well with your everyday activity. But from time to time, you know, you want it to be perfect. You know, you worry that you're going to make this little mistake. You um, overthink this. Uh, you want to make sure that you are on the right path. So that's that's my understanding of you know, high functioning um, anxiety. Of course, it's you know, if if we go into more detail of high functioning anxiety, we're going to talk uh, about um, the panic attacks. We want to talk more into um, the OCD. Be going to talk more about uh, phobias and so on. So that's sort of you know, that's the reason uh, leading out of high functioning anxiety. But to summarize, you know, high functioning anxiety to me is a you know, uh, a think um, transparent uh, protective shield around you. Uh, it's 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 there to um, protect you and making sure that you are safe, making sure that you are doing well, you are doing great with your activity. But you know, it, it, it's also there to you know stopping you and to make you overthink of many activity around you as well. Thank you for sharing, Bong. So I would have a quick recap for our audience as well. Um, this is my key takeaway from the uh, things that you have mentioned from two, of, uh, from two of the speakers. Please also correct me if I recap it in the wrong manner. Um, so first is that it is not uh, recognized as a mental illness. Um, because it does not really affect uh, us um, directly, to, uh, I would say. Um, second is that um, if you are having a high functioning anxiety, it's more of like you are seen as an achiever, but then you are not feeling fulfilled internally. So I would keep it um, in that way instead, because um, we have anxiety, but that anxiety does not really um, have, I would say um, it does not... Um, have much detriment impact on us because we can, we can still functioning very well. So um, this would be a foundation of our discussion today where we can kickstart with the um, high functioning anxiety. So uh, it also led to the second questions where um, our audience might also want to know um, more into uh, more specific ways that what are the characteristics or symptoms of high functioning anxiety um, and maybe also what are the root cause or any kinds of triggers that cause a person to actually um, have high functioning anxiety because um, not everyone having anxiety and know how to function really well so it's it's a very uh, it's a very extraordinary kind of concept for us to really see and identify the characteristics or symptoms of this um, kind of um, uh, anxiety. So um, anyone can share first. <laughs> sure, I can go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, yeah, so um, to put it into you know, one simple um, example, let's say you know, um, in general speaking, you know, people attend this um, networking event, uh, which have you know, 500, 600 people per event. And for a, 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 normal, um, a, so for a normal person living with anxiety, you know, the person 
would feel anxious and they would, you know, questioning themselves. They um, don't want to go to this networking event because they're not too sure, you know, where to start a conversation. A small task can be, you know, where to find car park for their motorbike, for their car and so on. So that sort of, that's a general speaking of those who are living with um, anxiety. But for high um, functioning anxiety, um, they are, are for, for them, um, when they go out, you know, to, to this big massive event for the networking event, yes, they, they, they're going to perform well, you know, for, for, for a small talk with their friend or with a new stranger, they, they, they found it difficult, but uh, for the task or a bigger task, they, they perform well. So when they attend this networking event, they know how to talk, they know how to approach people, they function well. So that's sort of, that's what we classify as the high function anxiety. And, and, and of course, you know, put it into a perspective that you know, um, for me, because I'm into the understanding of um, drama. So for me, I still believe that in a high functioning anxiety, there, there, there's something you know, happening in the past. It can be the past history of the person, can be something that related in the past. And going back into the attachment theories, so there's something that related to uh, their thoughts. So that's why they feel anxious of all these tasks that's stopping them from doing what they believe that they should do. So for example, let me put this into a concept of um, brain. Let's say in you know, our brain, we got these you know, different boxes in our brain. And, and sometimes you know, these boxes, they're going to open up one day. And I can, can guarantee that you know, one day this box is going to open up by itself. And for us you know, as an individual, uh, we should know that you know, when this box open up, we know how to close the box, we know how to you know, normalize the box and to understand that, hey, this box is not open up. I'm fine, I'm cool, there's nothing wrong with me. Let's close this, this box. So that's how you know, we, 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 we manage the high functioning um, anxiety. Of course, you know, from time to time, we see a person living with high functioning anxiety. They want to perform the best whatever they can, you know, a, a perfectionist. They want everything to be so perfect but you know, for me and my understanding, it is it is impossible. It is it is possible, you know, if you want to make everything so perfect. But it is uh, likely impossible that we want to make everything perfect because perfect is it's hard. So that's why that person facing it, the difficulty because you know, making everything something to be perfect to to the best of their interest, it's hard. And it's hard to meet that person uh, criteria. So that's why you know that's that's, that's a simple um, explanation you know of what is high functioning anxiety. Thank you, Bong. Um, Bong, would I, uh, Bong uh, Fadi, maybe you could also want to share something. Uh, thank you, and thank you, Bong Watanet, for your sharing. I mean, yes, I, again, I couldn't agree more with what you said. So high-functioning anxiety, like we talked earlier, it does not directly affect the functioning of the person. So they can still go to work, and some of them even work really well. They have successes. They are um, an overachiever. Uh, some may call them this type A personality where they have a lot of winning, they win um, many awards, they got so successful in their career, in their study, I mean, in even in other areas of their life, relationship and stuff. But the problem with high functioning anxiety is that it kind of goes under the radar. Like we also talked earlier that we cannot see it, but they feel unwell within themselves. So those people are the one who struggle with perfectionism. Again, like they try so much to have stuff done perfectly and they are scared of failure. They are scared of uncertainty. Some even call them the workaholics, like they work and work and work because underneath that they have this fear of not being good enough. So they cannot stop their thought, they cannot stop their um, behavior, they have to cling on to something in order to give them stability. And sometimes they are not aware of them, and that's the problem, because they are not aware that they are having distress and they are actually going towards something even more severe, so they are not aware. And if you ask me what are the cause of high-functioning anxiety, um, yes, I agree with one what earlier, history, really does play a big part in everyone's life. And in mental health, we actually talk about this um, biopsychosocial model in any mental health problem. So you have biology, psychology, and sociology around that person. So for example, that person, they might be um, prone to anxiety since they were really, really young. 
So they have a lot of anxiety going on in them. But then their psychology, like they were taught to be this perfect um, young kid. They were taught to be that, oh, you are so special. Like you cannot, uh, you cannot fail. You have to keep going and stuff and stuff. And then there are also this social pressure that um, praise them so much on their achievement. They praise them so much on being the good student that they are, being the good worker that they are. So when they have the anxiety, they feel scared or even not comfortable to open up. So they could like go around in their daily life doing all the work, but deep down they are very, very anxious. But from the outside, we cannot see it. We see that person as someone who is so um, successful, a lot of achievement and stuff and stuff. But if we look deeper, if we actually go a bit deeper, we might actually see some kind of impairment if we like spend some time with them and ask them. Yes, so I think those are some of the things that we can see in those with high functioning anxiety. Thank you, Wong. It's very interesting to hear two uh, same perspective, but two different aspects as well. Um, I would also have a question, a follow-up question to Wong Watana because he raised a very good example about networking events. I believe that everyone could actually um, relate and resonate with the situation already that each of us have to, you know, um, go out and do networking when, it, especially when it comes to professional spheres. Um, and also, you mentioned about trauma and how our brains have different boxes. And it's about how we know when to open these boxes or close that boxes. But then um, I would also have a follow up question on this that um, it's how do we um, come out of it? Because even though sometimes we do know that this is the trigger cause is because of the traumas that we have, but then we do not really know how to deal with our own trauma or how to get out of it or how to close that box or open this box. So that would be my questions for you. Um, and also to Wong Badi, um, you mentioned a, many, many good terms that we're relating to high functioning anxiety, for instance, like overachiever, perfectionism. Um, so my question would also be how to be more aware of, of who we are and kind of take a step back so that we do not, um, uh, we do not suffer or impact from high functioning anxiety because even sometimes we know that we are an overachiever we, and uh, we are a perfectionism, but we do not know how to really take a step back because we're, we're constantly in the process of like, I have to achieve it um, constantly. Uh, otherwise, I would feel like I'm being left out or I'm being very slow behind from a group of people that I'm around or maybe uh, at a professional work as well. So my question for you would be how to be uh, more aware of it and kind of um, step back and, and, and cope with ourselves. Uh, thank you very much. And I would ask Wong Watanak to answer the question first. For sure. Um, yes, there is a you know, treatment. You know, if, if, if you go to a um, sign medical health, there is a medicine for it. But for myself, I know from, again, um, talking therapists, I know that Wong Wendy hate me for this. But for me, I really don't like you know, to, to really put a label on, on people because, you know, um, yes, it, it, it's nice you know, to, to diagnose them with something, but diagnosing people, you know, from my perspective, I still believe that I mean, this is just putting a label on a person, you know, and that person within living this, you know, living with this label for life. And, and what does that mean, you know, by a person living with this label, with this name, which is a, a fancy name from, um, the, from the diagnosed booklet? Uh, for me, you know, when, when the box is open up or to close it down, it, it, it's not about, you know, here you go, the box is up, now it's time to close it down. But it's, it's about us, you know, to, to understand, yes, now this, this motion, this feeling is, is coming up and to understand that, hey, I'm fine, you know, now this, this feeling is coming up again, but who do I need to talk to? You know, you, you can go and seek uh, professional help by just talking it out loud. And, and talking it out loud, it helps a lot because you know, sometimes there's this um, 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 virus in our brain that you know, keep running around and around and we're not too sure where to start or where to end the conversation you know, because we want everything to be perfect and we're not too sure we lost the so many thoughts happening at the same time. But to, um, the, end, the end of the day, you know, the, the end of the day, you, you can find someone 
that close to you can be a like mom, dad, friend, or a professional who can you know, understand that feeling. They are there, um, not to giving you any recommendation or solution because that's not part of talking therapy. You know, they are there just to do their active listening, just to normalizing it, just to making sure that you lash out your, your emotion, your feeling, and from time to time, you would know you know how to manage those feeling. Um, uh, one simple you know, um, example or solution to this is we call this a CBT, a cognitive behavior therapy. So in cognitive behavior therapies is you know, when our brain you know, releases this uh, thoughts, this thinking that we never, for somehow this just a random thought popping up from, from, a, from a random time you know, at, at a random time. And for us to understand that, hey, why is this thought coming up at this time? What's the reason behind this thought? Uh, is this thought um, impacting me on anything? You know, how would I stop or pause this thought and how would I manage myself and pull myself back to where I am at the moment? So that's sort of a, a simple um, technique. And, and, and of course, you know, if you ask me, so how long does it take for this you know, treatment? How long does it take to resolve this? There's no way, you know, in, 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 in my whole career and, and in my education, there's no way on earth that I can provide the answer to that question because this is depending on each person and you know, what is the commitment that they put in counseling uh, um, um, session and, and how commitment and how fulfilled are they willing to get out of the counseling session. So that's how, you know, that's how we, 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 we're trying to help for them to understand the sorts, to understand the technique of you know, the box, how the brain is function, and for us as a counselor to challenge those sorts and to making sure that they are doing the right thing and to make sure that they're not, you know, um, overwhelmed with what they are um, doing. Thank you very much, Wong. So my key takeaway from, from your talk would be, one is to find an active listening, uh, listener, because it's very important to have your own safe space and to share your uh, thoughts and feelings and your progress to someone who you really trust and they're really listening to what you're uh, saying as well. So um, next, I would also have Bong Wadi to also answer the question. Um, please, Bong. Uh, yes, yes, thank you. Um, so um, continuing from what Bong Wadi has said, I think commitment is really important when dealing with actually any, any other mental health issue. And especially when we come to high functioning anxiety, commitment is even even more important uh, because this is something that the person themselves doesn't recognize that they are having. Sometimes they kind of feel like strange or something, but they are not sure what is really going on within themselves. So if they have commitment to understand themselves, to understand their own thoughts, their own um, emotion, it would be a really good start into getting over all the distress. I think one of the things that they can do is actually going out and into their support circle, as again, Bong Watanak had already said, um, you should have a really good support circle where you can open up, where you can share about what you're going through. And when they're doing active listening, they would give you this kind of space with no judgment where you can just um, go out and say whatever in your own head. And when you actually put it out, and sometimes you can even write it out, you can see what is actually going wrong within your own thinking. And what is what I see often in high functioning anxiety, and sometimes I have that myself, is the kind of wrong thinking that you actually have. So you tend to confuse your own thinking with the truth. Because sometimes your thinking is not really facts or it's not really true, but they are they tend to be certain negative thinking like for example, um, perfectionism. In perfectionism, you have this kind of thinking that I have to be perfect because if I don't get 100%, that would be the end of the world. But actually it is not. So if you take time and commit to yourself to understand it, you can sort of separate the two. Um, the 100% and the end of the world might be your thinking, but they are not true. The truth is we can never be perfect. And it's just something that we should be reminding ourselves again and again that even though we try to be good, we try to get it done as much as we can, we can never ever be perfect 100%. Even though we think we can be perfect now, maybe someone later come on, then they can do better than us. And for those with high functioning anxiety, they're going to be um, kind of scared of uncertainty like that. Like maybe in the future, I might fail or for example. So 
those are just some example of the uh, wrong thinking or negative thinking that you can sort of separate. So I think that would be a really good start into understanding and also dealing with your distress. Thank you very much, Wong, for sharing. Again, it, it's very, um, it has been in very, uh, a very insightful um, but I just want a quick reminder to our audience on Facebook, um, because if you want to ask any questions, please uh, join uh, via our Zoom link, because for our Q&A session, we will be conducting real Zoom uh, in a breakout session, not going on live, because we believe that touching upon mental health topic, we really want to create a safe space for you to not only ask questions, but also to maybe share your personal stories, um, or you need any good thoughts from our our speakers as well. So uh, if you have not, um, please also join via our Zoom link if you have any question later on. So uh, we have uh, a few minutes to go. Uh, I also want to uh, link uh, to another question because it might be interesting for some of us to know because um, it's uh, it, I, it's also something that I really want to know, to be honest. Um, it's that whether, whether high-functioning anxiety also um, associated with any other disorder or having um, high-functioning anxiety could also lead to any kinds of other disorder because um, normally um, it's quite common for us to have anxiety and some of us go through depression and everything. So it's like sometimes it's interconnected with one another. So uh, I would also want to know if high functioning anxiety actually associated with any kind of other disorder or it could lead us to having any other um, disorder as well. Um, I would ask Wong Watanak to share first. Sure, um, thank you. So um, from what I understand, uh, so there are four other um, diagnoses that you know, um, can be the outcome of high functioning anxiety. Um, the first one is GAD, so it's um, gen, uh, generalized anxiety um, disorder. Um, the second one is um, society, um, um, social anxiety. Um, the third one is panic attack. And the fourth one is um, specific phobia. So uh, what, so, okay, so let's, let me step through one by one. So GAD, generalized anxiety um, disorder, so basically, that is a diagnosis because there's the word disorder at the end. Um, it it has to be diagnosed from a professional within the field you know, who know how to diagnose using um, case like 10 different forms and questionnaires and so on to diagnose the person that um, the person is living with a, 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 a anxiety, a stress uh, of a um, society. So let's, uh, okay, let's put a simple um, example. So let's say, um, the person um, in COVID-19. So because of COVID-19, um, everyone talking about you know, this pandemic, uh, when you leave the house, you have to put masks on and so on. And when the person, you know, when they're about to leave the house, they it, it remind themselves they had, they had to put the mask on and that sort of trigger their anxious. So they worry that you know, if they go out, they're going to catch this um, um, COVID-19 virus. They anxious that, you know, how are people, other people, they're going to see them. Are they going to wear masks to the right place? Uh, is someone going to pinpoint them when they, they go out and so on? So that's sort of a generalized um, anxiety um, disorder. The second one is um, social anxiety. Um, and of course, this is again, going back to um, the judgment from the society. Let's say this can lead into um, the idea of body image, uh, leading to the idea of you know, um, education, uh, because we've been uh, raised from, uh, we call this a tiger parent, you know, a really strict parent. So you worry that you, know, you, you, you won't perform well at school, you won't get uh, your high distinction or A plus mark, and you need to be a perfect with everything. And if you don't get those marks, you worry that you know, if you come home, your family, your sibling, your neighbor, or people around you, they're going to you know, form this judgment and blaming to you. That's a um, social anxiety. Um, uh, uh, the next one is specific um, um, phobia. So it, it, it's phobia of, of, of anything. It can be you know, phobia of high, can be phobia of, um, of eating a, a certain thing you know, because it's going to cause harm of, of, of you. It, it's phobia of, I um, mean, you know, some people, they have phobia uh, of not riding a motorbike or riding car because they used to have this experience in the past. And that's why it's stopping them uh, uh, to go on motorbike or to go on cars again. And the last one is um, panic um, disorder. Again, it has to be diagnosed from a professional. 
and panic uh, disorder is if, if, if somehow you have this panic for all the time. Let's say you, know, you got into this um, tiny accident, let's say you, know, you, um, you cut your hand uh, while you're cooking and, and, it, and it split um, a little, but then you got you know, your body start building up this emotion and, and hit it up to your brain that, hey, you're bleeding, uh, this bleed cannot stop. In fact, yes, it can stop by itself, but your body, the way that they function is they're going to put this alarm that, hey, this is not going to stop, you know, you're going to be fine, a solution to this. Um, so that's sort of, that's the, um, that's the phobia because you worry that you, know, that you, you can't stop bleeding and the bleed will, will continue to bleed uh, until you death. So that's, that's the negative thoughts that you um, were having. Thank you, Bong. Um, how about Bong Wadi? Uh, would you mind sharing further? Uh, yes, actually, Bong Wadi already said so much. <laughs> already said almost in like, yeah, he answered the question really greatly. So he already mentioned many disorder that you could have if you are not careful about your high functioning anxiety, because as I have mentioned earlier, the high functioning anxiety is sort of in between, in between normal anxiety and, and um, other mental illness. So if you're not careful and you start to have it more and more severe, of course your functioning impairment is going to happen, that like you cannot hold it in forever. And you, then you could have other um, related anxiety, like uh, Bong Watanak mentioned, you have generalized anxiety, specific um, anxiety, specific phobia, social anxiety, and panic disorder, for example. So those are just some kind of the thing that you could have like at the end of a spectrum. Because normally when we talk about anxiety, we generally talk about a spectrum. Like you could have, okay, just normal anxiety where you could go to work, you could even perform well, and then it come up, up, up until the point, boom. You cannot function anymore. You cannot go to school. You cannot go to work. You cannot have um, fulfilling relationship. And there is one other thing that is also very common with um, actually any kind of um, anxiety problem is depression, of course. Actually, um, all about half of those with anxiety have um, coexisting depression. And for high functioning anxiety, they might even actually have high functioning depression underneath all of that. Because um, let's just look at this, like during the day, those high functioning anxiety go to work. They are an overachiever, they do all the work, they get all the stuff done, but when they come home at the end of the day, they might lie on their bed thinking, oh my God, why is my life so empty? What is the future I look like? And they just feel worthless. They feel um, depressed just to put into a simple word. So then they might not show it on the outside. And that is high functioning depression. And they coexist very commonly. And they even actually led to worsening of each and each um, other. So if you have high functioning anxiety and you have high functioning depression, then you have a higher risk of getting into a um, real diagnosis. I mean, I don't mean to scare you guys, but it's actually time to take care and commit to yourself to actually get over this. And this is not something that we can do alone because again, high functioning anxiety is um, so much connected to the stigma around it. We tend to praise um, successful people. We tend to praise the overachiever. So if society just take more attention like we are doing right now, that would be a really good step into dealing with this altogether. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wong, for sharing. So um, this could be a, a great reminder for all of us here because uh, having, because high function anxiety earlier we talked, it's not even, a, it's not recognized as a mental illness yet, but then it's actually associate, it can be possible to associate with many other kinds of um, disorder as well or other kinds of phobia. So it's very important for us to be very aware of ourselves and also to take care of our mental health um, regularly as well, just to always check in with our friends as well as check in with yourself and not to be achieving so much, doing so much, but having time for yourself as well. So uh, we're running almost an hour, but um, because we also want to allocate for around 15 to 20 minutes for the um, Q&A session as well. So I would like to ask um, our speakers the very last question and in a very general sense to um, conclude this uh, panel discussion as well. So uh, 
my last question would be what would be your last advice or reminder to everyone here when it comes to taking care of your mental health in general or to take care of our mental well-being as well uh, maybe some great tips and tricks uh, uh, to take care of ourselves as well thank you very much um, maybe this time on what we could start first <laughs> Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, so I think the fact that we actually have this webinar is also one step we that we are taking into dealing with um, mental issue. Uh, I hope that those with high functioning anxiety, maybe I hope you are not, but if you actually have it and you are listening to this, I hope that just by listening to this and realizing what we're going through, it might help you understand yourself a little bit more. And when you understand yourself, then you can start taking action into dealing with it. And if I was going to give just one tip for this webinar, it would be to normalize reaching out. I mean, there is so much stigma still exists around mental health. I know we are doing a lot to deal with that, on the local level, international level, but there are still stigma around it. And when it comes to high functioning anxiety, the stigma is even bigger because it looms around success, looms around the um, stereotype of successful people. So if we take more attention into those issues and we actually see the person for who they are and for what they are going through and not for their success and not to link success with not getting rest, so those are just some kind of examples surrounding the stigma. And I think if we could just normalize reaching out, getting rid of those stigma, a lot could be done to help um, a lot of mental issue and especially high functioning anxiety itself. And for the, very, for the person, when we talk about stigma, we generally talk about the society around them, about the family, the friends, but when for the person themselves, they also have stigma because sometimes the stigma doesn't just come from the people around you. They come from you yourself. So you, when you have commitment, you should get yourself out of that stigma. You should start believing in um, yourself. I know it's a cliche, but it's true. Uh, I mean, believing in your mental health because there is no health without mental health. And from my experience, I have seen a lot of people struggling with that. They care so much about their physical health, not so much about their mental health until their mental health reached the point of causing physical issue they started to have severe so headache, they have problems with their digestion, then that's when they start reaching out for help. And so there is so much that could be done for that. And actually it's even easier than when you deal with physical issues, to be honest, because um, in, in mental health, we have a lot of um, tools, mental tools, and a lot of solutions that you can do. And even if it doesn't work for you, it's okay. There is so much um, information that you can find and so much help that you can reach out to. So don't give up. If you feel like you've tried a few tips and it doesn't work, don't give up. There is always solution and then reach out to uh, the person around you, your support circle, and also there are professional help waiting to help you. And I've seen people with just um, mild symptom of anxiety, but when they reach out to professional help, it really helps them. And we are not going to label them anything. We will have them more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wong. How about Wong Watanet? Sure. I mean, you know, my uh, final advice would be uh, not even um, to pause. Sorry. Uh, sometime, you know, from time to time, that emotion, that feeling, that anxious is going to, you know, pop up at any time you know, without you noticing it. And when it pops up, you know, uh, it's, it's time for you to pause. So let's say an example, let's say that you, know, you go to um, Eon, a shopping center in Cambodia. So while you do your shopping you know, with your family or friend, you know, and then you know that this certain moment, this anxious feeling is popping up you know, at a random time you know, while you're doing your shopping. Um, at that moment, it's for you to pause uh, yourself um, not to freeze you know, in the middle of nowhere, but to pause your um, emotion and to say to yourself that, hey, I'm fine, you know, this emotion is popping up again. It's normal for me to feel this, this emotion. I mean, at, at that time, you can um, excuse yourself you know, from your family and friend or go out of the store just to, you know, breathe in and, and breathe out, just to relax yourself, just to tell yourself that, hey, I'm fine, there's nothing wrong with me. This feeling is popping up again. It's normal for me to witnessing it, to feeling this emotion. 
And when you know how to push yourself, I mean, you know, this is a really good exercise. Uh, yes, now you know how to stop yourself. And when you cool down again, then yes, you can go back into the source and continue your um, activity. So my advice is uh, know when to push and to um, acknowledge that yes, it is the emotion. It is, it is fine for you to witnessing it, for you to feel it, but it is also fine for you to um, accuse yourself from your groups of friends or from your family member just to have time by yourself and just to ground yourself, be who you are and making sure that you are safe before you go back to see them. Thank you very much, Bong. So um, this would be um, a conclusion of our panel discussion. And I just want to wrap up again with two key takeaways from our speakers. One is that your mental health is actually as important as your physical health. And it's not like, um, you have to put a lot of efforts in taking care of your mental health. It's even lesser than your physical health. So please take care of your mental health as much as uh, you intended to take care of your physical ones. And second is that all of your feelings and emotions are valid. And also please take it in, recognize it and process it. Don't just put it into any corner of uh, within yourself so that later on it would add up and up. So we would end our live on our Facebook page right here. And now it comes to the um, breakout session where audience in our Zoom right here can ask questions and also share their personal stories. So I would also ask a few minutes uh, from our speakers for our technical team to actually um, launch the breakout room as well. Thank you very much, Bong. <laughs>